Chapter Two of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush. Winning the Sheriff's Golden Arrow. It was very pleasant in Sherwood Forest to those who did not fear hardship and robin hood and his men came to love every tree that grew and every bird that sang there they did not mind that they had no houses to live in they made themselves shelters of bark and logs to keep the rain off and mostly they stayed in the open they did not sigh for soft beds or fine tables and furnishings they put down rushes and spread deer skins over them to lie on and slept under the stars they cooked over a great fire built beside a big tree and they sat and ate on the ground more than a hundred men were in robin hood's band every one was devoted to him and obeyed his slightest word they were the best archers the best wrestlers the best runners and the best wielders of cudgel and quarter-staff in all the country and they grew better continually for they practised these things every day robin hood was the best archer in all the land even the king had heard of his wonderful marksmanship and even though he knew him an outlaw he had an admiring and almost kindly feeling for this bold outlaw who shot so marvellously well but the greedy lords and churchmen who oppressed the people hated robin hood and the sheriff of nottingham hated him most of all and wished above all things to hang him on the gallows he was a cruel hard man with no kindness in his bosom and all his spite was turned against robin hood because every time that he tried to catch him robin outwitted him now he was especially angered for he had sent a messenger with a warrant to take robin hood and the merry robin had met the messenger and feasted him and then while he was asleep after the feast stolen the very warrant out of his pocket so that he had to go back to the sheriff without man or warrant either so the sheriff of nottingham used all his wits to get another plan to take robin hood it was plainly of no use to send men no matter how stout with warrants after him he must be coaxed into their clutches i have it said the sheriff of nottingham at last with a very sour look on his grim face i'll catch him by craft i'll proclaim a great archery festival and get all the best archers in england to come here to shoot i'll offer for the prize an arrow of beaten gold that will be sure to fetch robin hood and his men here and then i'll catch them and hang them now robin hood and his men did come to the archery contest but they did not come in the suits of lincoln green that they wore as men of the forest each man dressed himself up to seem somebody else some appeared as barefoot friars some as travelling tinkers or tradesmen some as beggars and some as rustic peasants robin hood was the hardest to recognize of all don't go master his men had begged this archery contest is just a trap to catch you the sheriff of nottingham and his men will be looking for you and they will know you by your hair and eyes and face and height even if you wear different clothes the sheriff has made this festival just to lure you to death don't go but robin hood laughed merrily why as to my yellow hair i can stain that with walnut stain as to my eyes i can cover one of them with a patch and then my face will not be recognized i would scorn to be afraid and if an adventure is somewhat dangerous i like it all the better so robin hood went clad from top to toe in tattered scarlet the raggedest beggar man that had ever been seen in nottingham the field where the contest was to be held was a splendid sight rows and rows of benches had been built on it for the gentlefolk to sit on and they wore their best clothes 
and were gayer than birds of paradise as for the sheriff and his wife they wore velvet the sheriff purple and his lady blue their rich garments were trimmed with ermine they wore broad gold chains around their necks and the sheriff had shoes with wondrously pointed toes that were fastened to his gold embroidered garters by golden chains oh they were dressed very splendidly and if their faces had been kind they would have looked beautiful but their faces were full of pride and hate the sheriff was looking everywhere with spiteful glances for robin hood and very cross he was that he did not see robin there but robin was there though the sheriff did not see him there he stood in his ragged beggar's garments not ten feet away from the sheriff the targets were placed eighty yards from where the archers were to stand pace that off and see what a great distance it is there were a great number of archers to shoot and each was to have one shot then the ten who shot best were to shoot two arrows each and the three who shot best out of the ten were to shoot three arrows apiece the one who came nearest to the centre of the target was to get a prize the sheriff looked gloweringly at the ten i was sure that robin hood would be among them he said to the man-at-arms at his side could no one of these ten be robin hood in disguise no answered the man-at-arms six of these i know well they are the best archers in england there is jill of the red cap dickon crookshank adam of the dell william a leslie hubert a cloud and swithin a hartford of the four beside one is too tall and one too short and one not broad-shouldered enough to be robin hood there remains only this ragged beggar and his hair and beard are much too dark to be robin hood's and beside he is blind in one eye robin hood is safe in sherwood forest even as he spoke the man-at-arms was glad for he was but a common soldier and he loved robin hood and wished no harm to come to him one reason why robin hood got away from the sheriff so many times was that the common people even among the sheriff's own men were friendly to him and helped him all they could the gatekeepers shut their eyes when robin hood went through the gates that they might say they had not seen him enter hardly any one would betray him and many when they knew of evil being planned against him sent warning to him but even the man-at-arms who loved him did not recognize robin hood to-day the ten made wonderful shots not one arrow failed to come within the circles that surrounded the centre but when the three shot it was more wonderful still jill of the red cap's first arrow struck only a finger's breadth from the centre and his second was nearer still but the beggar's arrow struck in the very centre adam of the dell who had one more shot unstrung his bow when he saw it fourscore years and more have i shot shaft and beaten many competitors but i can never better that he said the prize of the golden arrow belonged to the tattered beggar but the sheriff's face was very sour as he gave it to him he tried to induce him to enter his service promising great wages you are the best archer i have ever seen he said i trow you shoot even better than that rascal and coward of a robin hood who dared not show his face here to-day will you join my service no i will not answered the scarlet-clad stranger and then the sheriff looked at him so spitefully that he knew it was well to get away as he walked toward sherwood forest the sheriff's words rankled i cannot bear to have even my enemy think that i am a coward he said to little john i wish there was a way to tell the sheriff that it was robin hood that won his golden arrow and they found a way that evening the sheriff sat at supper and though the supper was a fine one his face was gloomy i thought i could catch that rascal robin hood by means of this archery contest he said to his wife 
but he was too much of a coward to show his face here just then something came through the window and fell rattling among the dishes on the table it was a blunted grey goose quill with a bit of writing tied to it the sheriff unfolded the writing it told that it was robin hood who had won the golden arrow when the sheriff read it even his wife thought best to slip away for he was the crossest man in nottingham end of chapter two chapter three of the story of robin hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush chapter three how little john joined robin hood this is the story of how robin hood gained his right-hand man and dearest friend little john little john was one of the tallest and strongest youths that ever walked through a forest when robin hood first saw him he was walking in the edge of the forest and came to a narrow bridge across a stream the bridge was so narrow that but one could go across it at once and it chanced that robin hood stepped upon it from one side just as little john stepped on the other go back and let the better man cross before you called robin hood not because he cared a bit but rather with a mirthful wish to see what the tall youth would do stand back yourself i am the better man cried the stranger let us fight for it said robin hood who loved a good bout more than his dinner with all my heart answered the stranger then robin cut him a stick of oak to serve as a quarter-staff for he would have held it a shame to use his bow and arrows when the other had no such weapon and they met as joyously as two boys wrestling for sport the one who can knock the other into the water is the better man said robin then the fight with the staves began what a fight it was they struck again and again but so skilful was each one in warding off blows that neither could knock the other down many hard blows each one took until there were sore bones and bumps and black and blue spots in plenty but neither thought of stopping for that a whole hour they fought there on the bridge and neither could get the better of the other then another hour at last robin gave the stranger a terrible whack that made him stagger but the stranger returned with a crack on the crown that made the blood flow robin whacked back at him savagely but the stranger avoided the blow and gave one to robin that tumbled him fairly into the water he lay there looking up and laughing for robin hood never bore any malice you have a right sturdy hand with that cudgel never have i been beaten before he laughed he splashed ashore and seized the stranger's hand i like you well he said now watch and i will show you something he put his horn to his lips and blew and up came two score of robin hood's followers all clothed in lincoln green and bearing bows and arrows and swords how is this master said the foremost you were all bruised and wet to the skin yon sturdy fellow has given me a drubbing and tumbled me into the water he said then he shall get a ducking and a drubbing himself said will stutely starting forth angrily followed by half a dozen all eager to carry out his threat but robin hood ordered him back no he said it was a fair fight and he won i would not have you hurt him for anything but he is a right brave and lusty youth and i would fain have him in our band will you join yourself to my men he asked of the wandering stranger i am robin hood and my band is the finest in all england hardly a man in the country but would have trembled at the name but little john the strange youth was afraid of no man if there is any man among you who can shoot a better shaft than i i will he said well i will try 
said Robin. He sent Will Stutely to set up a piece of white bark, four fingers in breadth, on an oak eighty yards away. Now choose any of our bows and arrows to shoot with, he said. The stranger chose the very stoutest bow. Then he aimed his arrow carefully and sent it down the path, and it struck the very center of the mark. All Robin Hood's followers caught their breaths in amaze. That is a fine shot indeed, said Robin Hood heartily. No one could better it, but perhaps I may mar it. Then he shot an arrow, and so true and swift it sped that it struck the stranger's arrow and splintered it into pieces, and all who saw it cried out that there never was such shooting before. Now, will you not come into my band? said Robin Hood with a smile. With all my heart, answered the stranger, and from that minute he loved Robin as his dearest friend. What is your name? said Will Stutely, taking out a tablet as though he would enroll it. John Little, answered the stranger youth. I like not the name, said Mary Will. This fellow is too small to be called John Little. Let us christen him over Little John. And so they had a christening and great sport, and from that day Little John was Robin Hood's right-hand man and second-in-command over the band. True and faithfully did he serve Robin for many years, and loved him better with every year. End of chapter 3chapter 5 of the story of robin hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush chapter 5 robin hood in the sorrowful night we have had no guests for a long time said robin hood one day let us go and look for some Little John, you go to the east, and I will go to the west, and we will see if we do not find passing a greedy noble, or fat churchman, who carries too much of this world's goods with him, and needs to be relieved for the good of the poor. Now, when Robin Hood and his men robbed a man, they never molested any but the rich, who had made their wealth by grinding down the poor. They brought him into the forest, and made a feast for him. Then, after he had feasted, they told him he must pay his reckoning, and they took his goods, or gold that he carried, and divided these into three piles. One-third they gave back to him, one-third they kept for themselves, and the other third they distributed to the poor. The rich and grasping stuttered at the very mention of Robin Hood's feasts, but the poor breathed blessings on his name whenever they thought of him. So Little John and his part of the band went to the east, and they were lucky, for they brought in the rich bishop of Hereford, with five sumpter mules loaded with goods. But Robin Hood in his half found only a sorrowful knight, who sighed as he rode along, and seemed too sad to notice anything. Robin Hood laid his hand on his bridle, stopping his horse. Hold, he said. I would speak with you. Now who are you who would stop a peaceful traveller on the king's highway? asked the knight. Some call me an honest man, and some call me a robber, answered Robin Hood. At any rate, I and my men have an inn in the forest where we want you to stop and feast, but we let you know that we count upon our guests paying the reckoning. I take your meaning answered the knight, but I am no guest for you, for I have no money. Indeed, I am in great sorrow by reason of this very thing. Having great need of money to save the life of my son, I mortgaged my estate to the prior of Emmet, and, though I could raise the money, if he would give me more time, he will not give me a day, but means to seize the estate and turn me out a beggar. How much money did you borrow of him? asked Robin Hood. Only four hundred pounds. The estate is worth many times that. 
but he will show no mercy. Have you no friends who could lend you the money? asked Robin Hood. Alas, no, answered the knight. When I was fortunate, I had many friends who crowded around me, but now that I have come to trouble, they all have deserted me. Well, the men who are in trouble always have friends in Sherwood Forest, answered Robin Hood. Come with me as a free guest, and we will find a way to help you. So they went on, until they came to the great tree where Friar Tuck and half a dozen others were preparing the feast around a huge fire, and there in the light of the flames sat the bishop of Hereford under guard, with his sumpter mules, with their loaded packs tied to the trees around. "'Have mercy,' he whined. But Robin Hood answered sternly, "'What mercy have you ever shown to the poor? Men, open his packs.' So they opened the packs, which were full of rich goods, and divided them up into three parts. Beside the packs of goods there was a box that held fifteen hundred pounds in gold. Robin Hood took up the portion divided out for the poor, and gave it to the sorrowful knight. "'Since the churchmen have despoiled you, the churchmen shall help you,' he said. "'Oh, I thank you,' cried the knight, his sorrowful face lighting up for the first time that day. "'But I will not take it as a gift, but as a loan. I will pay it back to the bishop or to you.' The bishop nodded and opened his mouth to say, "'That is well.' But Robin Hood interrupted him shortly. "'Pay it to me,' he said. I will help the poor with it. The bishop would but crowd it into his own coffers, and use it to gain more money. So the knight, who had been so sorrowful, departed with all his troubles cleared away. Sorely disappointed was the prior of Emmet, for he had made sure, by cheating and craft, that the poor knight, who had fallen into his clutches, could not get the money to redeem his lands anywhere, and he counted them already in his grasp but he had to give them up and that is a story too but we have not room to tell it here end of chapter five chapter six of the story of robin hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush robin hood and the king i wish i could see robin hood said king richard i wish i could see him and his men shoot and wrestle and go through all the feats in which they have such wondrous skill but if they heard that the king was coming they would think it was only to arrest them and they would flee deep into the forest and i should never get a glimpse of them king richard spoke kindly for he was a king who loved all manly sports, and those who excelled in them. "'I would give a hundred pounds to see Robin Hood and his men in the greenwood,' he said. "'I'll tell you how you can see him without a doubt,' spoke up one of the king's trusty companions with a laugh. "'Put on the robes of a fat abbot, and ride through Sherwood Forest, with the hundred pounds in your pouch, and you will be sure to see him, and be feasted by him.' "'I'll do it!' cried bluff king richard slapping his knee it will be a huge joke so he and seven of his followers dressed themselves as an abbot and seven black friars and rode out along the highway toward sherwood forest robin hood and his men took them and brought them back to the trystal tree and there they searched them and took the pouch of gold but they gave half the gold back to the king for it was not their custom to leave any man in need. They were pleased with these travellers, because they did not resist, nor rail at them. "'Now we shall give you a feast that will be worth fifty pounds,' said Robin Hood. "'I have a good appetite for a feast,' said the pretended abbot, "'but even more do I desire to see the archery and wrestling and play with the quarter-staff and all those things in which I am told you excel.' you shall see the best we can do answered robin hood but i pray you holy father lay aside your cowl that you may enjoy this sweet evening air no answered the mock abbot 
it may not be for i and my brothers have vowed not to let our faces be seen during this journey very well then said robin hood i interfere with no man's vows and he never dreamed that it was the king they gave them a splendid feast of roasted venison and pheasant and fish and wild fowls all done to a turn over the roaring fire and the best of drink then they arranged the sport the target was a garland of leaves and flowers that was hung six score paces distant upon a stake it was a mark that only the best of archers could hit at all now shoot said robin hood you shall each have three shots and every one who fails to place his arrows within the garland shall forfeit the arrow and receive beside a box on the side of the head as stout as can be given can any one hit inside that little garland at such a distance asked the king in amaze look and see said robin hood proudly first david of doncaster shot and lodged all three arrows within the garland while the king looked on astonished then midge the miller's son and he also placed all his arrows inside of the garland then wat the tinker drew his bow but he was unlucky for one of his arrows missed the mark by the breadth of two fingers come here and take your punishment called robin hood the king supposed that since he had missed by so little he would receive but a light tap but he got a blow that knocked him spinning across the grass heels overhead ha 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 laughed his comrades and oh ho thought king richard i am glad i am not in this but he was much impressed with the way robin hood's men obeyed him they are better to follow his commands than my servants are to follow mine he thought the shooting went on and most of the men shot their arrows within the garland but a few missed and received tremendous buffets last robin hood shot his first shaft split off a piece of the stake on which the garland was hung his second lodged a scant inch from the first but the last arrow he shot was feathered faultily and it swerved to one side and smote an inch outside of the garland then all the company roared with good-natured laughter for it was seldom indeed that they saw their master miss go and take your punishment master said midge the miller's son i hope it will be as heavy as watts well said robin hood i will forfeit my arrow to our guest and take my buffet from him now the merry robin was somewhat crafty in this for though he did not mind hard knocks at all he did not like the thought of being sent sprawling before his band the hands of the churchmen were soft and their strongest blows but feeble for they did not work nor use their muscles much but the pretended abbot bared an arm so stout and muscular that it made the yeomen stare robin hood placed himself fairly in front of him and he struck such a blow that would have felled an ox down went robin hood on the ground rolling over and over and his men fairly shouted with laughter well said robin hood sitting up half dazed i did not think that there was an arm in england that could strike such a blow who are you man i'll warrant you are no churchman as you seem then richard threw his cowl and robin knew his king if he had been a disloyal man as well as an outlaw he would have trembled then but though he knelt at the king's feet and signalled all his men to kneel his voice was not ashamed your majesty he said you have no subjects in all england more loyal to you than i and my merry men we have done no evil except to certain of the greedy and rich who oppressed your subjects we crave your pardon if we have done wrong and we beg for your protection and swear that we will ever serve you faithfully then the king looked down in amazement that an outlaw should speak so but he knew men and he knew what people said of robin hood and he knew too that he was the best archer in all england and he wanted him in his own train i will forgive all your law-breaking he said if you will come with me to my court and serve me there you shall take little john and will scarlet and allen a dale 
who is the sweetest singer i ever heard and the rest of your men i will make into royal rangers since i judge they can protect sherwood forest better than any others so robin hood left the greenwood and went to the king's court and he served king richard well but he did not like the confinement of the court and could not abide the gaieties and jealousies of the courtiers after king richard died his brother john took the throne and he was one of the worst kings that ever ruled england then robin hood went back to the forest and his merry men gathered around him once more and again they became outlaws and there in the forest he lived till he died end of chapter six chapter seven of the story of robin hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush chapter seven death of robin hood now the manner of robin hood's death was in this wise he had grown to be an old man and he became ill of a fever. I will go to my cousin, the prioress of Kirkley's, for she hath much knowledge of healing, he said. I will ask her to bleed me, that I may become well. In those days the women had more knowledge of healing than any others, for it was the duty of every mother and daughter to learn as much as she could about it, that she might know what to do if her husband or her son were wounded. This cousin of Robin Hood's was greatly indebted to him, for she had got her good place as prioress, but she loved one of his enemies, and she dealt treacherously with him. She opened a vein in his arm, but, but she did not close it up again. Then she left him alone in a high room at the very top of the priory to bleed to death. All day long he bled till he was so weak that he could hardly move. But at evening he managed to lift his bugle to his lips and blow. The blast was but feeble, but little John heard it, for, though the prioress refused to let him in with Robin Hood, he had lingered as close to his dear master as he could get all day long. The prioress locked the great entry door so that he might not come in, and he seized a huge stone mortar that three men could not lift ordinarily and hurled it against the door, crashing it in. Then he dashed up the winding stairs, and none could stay him, until he reached the room under the eaves where his master lay. But he saw at a glance that Robin Hood was dying. Master, he cried, I will burn the priory down over the heads of these vile nuns, whose mistress has done you such dreadful treachery. No, no, said Robin Hood with a smile that was feeble, but was wondrous sweet. I have never hurt a woman in my life, nor allowed my followers to do it. I could not allow such a thing now. And with almost his last breath, he made Little John promise to do no injury to the treacherous nun who had killed him. There are many stories about Robin Hood. There is not enough space here to put down half of them. I hope you will ask for them at the library and read them all, and some of the quaint old ballads about him too, and I hope, most of all, that every boy who reads them will try to be as kindly and as helpful and as generous and as brave and chivalrous to all womankind as Robin Hood was. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush. Robin Hood and Allan a Dale. Come listen to me, you gallant so free, all you that love mirth for to hear. 
and i will tell you of a bold outlaw that lived in nottinghamshire as robin hood in the forest stood all under the greenwood tree there he was aware of a brave young man as fine as fine might be the youngster was clad in scarlet red in scarlet fine and gay and he did frisk it over the plain and chaunted a round delay as robin hood next morning stood amongst the leaves so gay there did he espy the same young man come drooping along the way the scarlet he wore the day before it was clean cast away and at every step he fetched a sigh alas and well a day then stepped forth brave little john and midge the miller's son which made the young man bend his bow when he saw them come stand off stand off the young man said what is your will with me you must come before our master straight under yon greenwood tree and when he came bold robin before robin asked him courteously o oh, hast thou any money to spare for my merry men and me i have no money the young man said but five shillings and a ring and that i have kept the seven long years to have at my wedding yesterday i should have married a maid but she was from me tain and chosen to be an old knight's delight whereby my poor heart is slain what is thy name then said robin hood come tell me without any fail by the faith of my body then said the young man my name it is allan a dale what wilt thou give me said robin hood in ready gold or fee to help thee to thy true love again and deliver her unto thee i have no money then quoth the young man in ready gold nor fee but i will swear upon a book thy true servant for to be how many miles is it to thy true love come tell me without guile by the faith of my body then said the young man it is but five little mile then robin he hasted over the plain he did neither stint nor lin until he came unto the church where allen should keep his wedding what dost thou hear the bishop then said i prithee now tell unto me i am a bold harper quoth robin hood and the best in the north country oh welcome oh welcome the bishop he said that music best pleaseth me you shall have no music said robin hood till the bride and bridegroom i see with that came in a wealthy knight which was both grave and old and after him a finikin lass did shine like the glistering gold this is not a fit match quoth robin hood that you do seem to make here for since we are come into the church the bride shall choose her own dear then robin hood put his horn to his mouth and blew blast two or three when four and twenty yeomen bold came leaping over the lee and when they came into the churchyard marching all in a row the first man was allen a dale to give bold robin his bow this is thy true love robin he said young allen as i hear say and you shall be married this same time before we depart away that shall not be the bishop cried for thy word shall not stand they shall be three times asked in the church as the law is of our land robin hood pulled off the bishop's coat and put it upon little john by the faith of my body then robin said this cloth doth make thee a man when little john went into the choir the people began to laugh he asked them seven times into church lest three times should not be enough who gives me this maid said little john quoth robin hood that do i and he that takes her from allen a dale 
full dearly he shall buy and then having ended this merry wedding the bride looked like a queen and so they returned to the merry green wood amongst the leaves so green author unknown end of chapter eight end of the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush